Hey everyone, welcome back to 996 The Howl for housekeeping. The rookie tournament in Arizona is starting tomorrow and they still haven't announced their away jerseys and they're still using the Howl Yote as their away jersey in their developmental camp scrimmages and I assume for the rookie tournament starting tomorrow as well. I found out Josh Doan is not participating in the rookie tournament because he has college classes still going on at ASU so finally found a reason for him not being on the rookie tournament roster other than that the Cowboys finally announced their new assistant GM to Bill Armstrong and it's it's John Ferguson Jr. now if you're if you're on the interwebs if you're online if you're a Coyotes fan I'm sure you caught some flack yesterday it's a bit warranted but I think a lot of time has passed uh, if you don't really know what I'm talking about, this is mainly John Ferguson Jr. had a terrible time as general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs in literally the mid-2000s, so like 15 years ago uh, when he was 36 years old. Since then, he's moved on to the Boston Bruins system where he was director of player development and was in charge of the Providence Bruins for uh, the la since 2016, so I guess for the last five years he's been with the Bruins and now he will be in charge of the Tucson Roadrunners and he is replacing Steve Sullivan who left the organization abruptly and unceremoniously so they finally found a replacement so let's get into it why you know the Toronto fan base it's a loud group it's a big group so I'm sure they would dominate the conversation or they do dominate the conversation Whenever John Ferguson Jr.'s name pops up, it hasn't popped up much in the last five years. He's been quiet, which is good. But usually when teams are hiring for GMs, his name might pop up. Not sure. I don't think he's ever interviewed for the Coyotes for their general manager manager position. But, you know, whenever his name pops up, uh, Leafs fans just go in a craze and say how he's the worst human being ever on planet Earth. So let's get into, you know, what make what made him a bad GM, and then we'll get into what he's been doing the past five years. So I found a website that has his top six worst moves. Some of them I don't agree with, uh, like number six right here, signing Michael Pekka to a one-year deal. This was a trend in the mid-2000s for the Leafs, just acquiring aged veterans like Ron Francis, Michael Pekka. We'll talk about Brian Leach in number five. Uh, I think Phil Housley, who is the assistant coach for the Coyotes currently, uh, and just getting a bunch of old, like Eric Lindros, who was good, I think, but getting a lot of older veterans wanting to extend their window, not admitting that they need to rebuild. This is the era of the Leafs we're talking about. It was a dark time for the Leafs in the mid-2000s, leading up to 2010, and then the 20, early 2010s before they got Matthews. It was always a dark period for the Maple Leafs, and I guess this kind of kick-started all of that. So he signs Michael Pekka to a one-year deal. He reached 50 points, or did he? Um, for whatever reason, Ferguson seemed to, believe, seemed to believe that Pekka still had the shutdown game he plays with throughout the years of his career, but being in his 12th NHL season, Pekka was on the decline and handing him over $2 million dollars. It's certainly not a move Ferguson would consider doing again. Again, $2 million, I guess, in 2006. Uh, that's not a lot of money, but, you know, he got uh, 35 games, 15 points for $2 million. It's rough, but, you know, that, that happens to GMs. I'm not saying John Ferguson Jr. in this video was a good GM. I'm just saying if, you, if people are making fun of you for this hire, this is probably the reason why, just to get you more accustomed to... Uh, our new assistant GM's history. So we'll move on to probably a more darning trade, which is um, he was also known for giving away a lot of picks, especially first round picks, just like this one, acquiring Brian Leach for a first round pick. Uh, let's read the blurb here. Remember how great it was for Toronto fans to see Brian Leach step up, a step out onto the ice in the blue and white. At first glance, this Ferguson moved in seem that bad. Two prospects and a couple of picks that wouldn't really turn into anything for one of the game's best defensemen of all time. But here are here are a few things to consider. While Calgary would eventually choose Chris Chucko, 
no idea who that is, with the former Leafs pick at 24th overall. He's going to go on and list a bunch of players that went past the 24th overall. So what this journalist is saying is that the Leafs foregone a high-quality player in exchange for Brian Leach. So if the Leafs still held on to this first-round pick, they would get players like Carl Soderberg in his prime, Corey Schneider, Dubinsky, Goligoski, David Krejci. He also lists uh, Andre Pavlich, Paul Statsny, Chris Letang, Jonathan Quick, Keith Yando, and Nicholas Jomerson. So this journalist, this writer is saying if they didn't make that trade and they held on to their first, they would have got a prime, high-end NHL player if they held on to the pick instead of getting an aged veteran like Brian Leach. It's a nice picture of Jonathan Quick, I guess. With that in mind, Leach went on to play 15 games. Okay, that's bad. With the Maple Leafs recording 15 points. Okay. Point per game, but still only 15 po- fifteen games for a first-round pick. Yeah, uh, that's pretty bad. Trading a first-round pick that could have turned into any of those players I mentioned only for 15 games. Yeah, that's a rough one. Uh, firing Pat Quinn. Pat Quinn was... A fan favorite among Toronto Maple Leafs fans. He was the coach for the Leafs for a long time. And uh, while he never took the Leafs further than the conference finals, but at least getting there is a pretty big deal for Leafs fans, he did bring the Leafs and their fans a lot of extra hockey during the spring seasons. He was he was part of the blue and white. What makes it so much more questionable is that Quinn finished his career with 684 wins, leaving him six on the all-time wins list. In his final season before he was fired, he led the Leafs to a 41-33-8 record, narrowly missing the playoffs with 90 points. 90 points is pretty good. Rumors flew regarding the reasons for firing, with speculation that Quinn and Ferguson weren't seen eye-to-eye, but it says something when players like Matt Sundin and Darcy Tucker, really weird saying those names, Uh, publicly support their former coach prior to his release from the team. But Quinn was fired regardless, and Leafs have made the playoffs just one time since 03-04. I guess this is an outdated article. They made the playoffs numerous times with Matthews once they got him. But I guess between 03 and 04 to Matthews, they only made it once, which was, I guess, the debacle against the Bruins um, losing in that Game 7. So, uh, Pat Quinn... Obviously has passed away. My condolences to him and his family. But yeah, firing a fan favorite coach who had a good winning record. Six all time on the NHL wins list as a coach. Narrowly missing the playoffs with 90 points. I can see why Leafs fans uh, would disagree with that move for firing Pat Quinn. So number three, John Ferguson Jr. signs Jason Blake to a five-year deal. After a 40-goal, 69-point season in 06-07 with the Islanders. The Leafs and Ferguson signed the free agent to a five-year contract worth $20 million. Now, Blake did have productive years with the Leafs, recording 52 points in 07-08, followed by 63 points in 08-09. So 63 points, not bad. The 52-point season is a huge decline from 69 points. But the small forward never reached that 40-goal plateau in his time with the Leafs. In fact, he never reached the 30-goal mark. In two and a half seasons, he spent with the blue and white. So it's a free agent signing that went south. A lot of GMs have uh, faced that reality and have that blemish on their resume of signing bad free agents who've come off great um, seasons. But yeah, pretty poor if you sign a free agent who scored 40 goals and he never reached 30 goals with your team. uh, That's a mistake, I would agree. So, following a disappointing start to the 09-2010 season, where he had just 26 points in 56 games, a huge decline. Leafs and general manager Brian Burke. Okay, so I guess after Ferguson after Ferguson was fired, it was Brian Burke at the helm. Traded um, the Phil, the former Bill Masterton Trophy winner to Anaheim, along with Toscala for John Sebastian Shiger. Not really sure what that sentence (laughs) means. I guess he traded Jason Blake for Tosca. Not sure. Not sure. This writer, maybe we'll get more context here. So John Ferguson Jr. trades a first round pick again. 
um, who turned out to be Lars Eller, who was who a great NHLer. Also, Craig Smith was is a good player, fourth round pick. To San Jose for Vesa Toskala and Mark Bell. Uh, Vesa Toskala had a rough career with the Leafs. He's most known for letting in a goal where the opposing team shot the puck from their own end of the ice and it bounces down the ice and over Toskala. That's, that's a funny moment for Toskala being a Toronto Maple Leaf. So we'll read the blurb here. Maple Leafs GM made a deal with the San Jose Sharks, or at least it looked like one from a Leafs standpoint, made a big deal. Ferguson moved two picks in the 07 draft, a first and second, and a fourth round pick in 09 in exchange for Toskala and Mark Bell. Toskala coming off two strong seasons, platooning the Sharks, where he put up a 49-17-5 record in 75 games. Ooh, that's a great, that's a great season. Uh, coming to Toronto, he was pegged as the number one, playing 119 games in his first two seasons with the Leafs. In his two and a half season with, seasons with the Leafs, his record was 62-54-20. That's really bad. He had a goals against over three and a sub-900 save percentage. Poor backup style numbers right there. A huge cliff dive, a huge decline in Toscala's career. I liked him on the San Jose Sharks. You know, he was coming coming in after Nabokov or was a backup to Yevgeny Nabokov. And um, I remember his playoff series were always good. And then the Leafs acquired him and things went south. It seems to be a narrative with the Leafs in the mid-2000s uh, when they acquire players like, like we mentioned, Jason Blake, Brian Leach, now Toscala. Players who had good careers on other teams come to the Leafs and they can't produce at the same standard that they're used to producing. So what exactly did the Leafs give up? Uh, St. Louis would eventually use Toronto's pick to select Lars Eller ahead of guys like Shannon Kirk, Pacioretty, Perron, and Brendan Smith. I don't know why he mentioned Brendan Smith there. St. Louis also got the Leafs' second round pick from the Sharks and took a player who didn't amount to much. In 07, San Jose also moved at least fourth round pick in 09 to Nashville, where the Predators took Craig Smith. Craig Smith, who's now on Boston, who had a pretty good season playing alongside Krejci, and even the playoffs playing alongside Taylor Hall. So, but what could the Leafs have had with these picks had they held on to them? In 07, they would have had an opportunity to draft PK Subban who went 43rd overall. They could have scored Wayne Simmons, which they ended up getting him anyways, who also didn't do much. Justin Falk, Martinez, Jamie Benn could have all been Leafs. So he's also once again saying if the Leafs hung on to those picks, there was high quality NHL players that they could have had instead of a disappointing, declining Vesa Toscala. So his number one worst move, the meme which I'm sure if you know who John Ferguson Jr. is, you know about this trade. This is the main reason why people make fun of him and why the Coyotes caught flack for hiring him as assistant general manager. So we'll read it finally. Easily one of the most memorable and memeable trades in recent years. Ferguson moved Tuka Rask to the Boston Bruins in exchange for Andrew Raycroft. Raycroft was coming off a disappointing season with the Bruins, but had just won the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year the previous season, where he won 29 of his 57 games with a 2.05 goals against average and 9.26 save percentage. I assume that was a pretty poor Calder class because 29 wins gets you the Calder Trophy, I guess. The Leafs also had Justin Pogge coming off a great World Junior Championship where he took Canada to the gold medal. He went undefeated in six games, giving up to six goals and recording three shootouts in the process. Very good. So surely he was the future of the Leafs organization. Pogi played just seven games for the Leafs and uh, his only seven games in the National Hockey League and recorded just one win. Uh, wow. Uh, he allowed 27 goals in those seven games. Raycroft would play four more seasons after his 91 games in a Leafs uniform before leaving the NHL. And we all know who Tuka Rask is. So those are six reasons why everyone likes to jump on and dogpile John Ferguson Jr. Whenever his name 
comes up in the news. Let's see what he's been doing since he's gotten fired from the Leafs. So he went on in the late 2000s to early 2010s being the director of professional scouting for the Sharks and then moving on to the Boston Bruins system in 2014-2015 and then being promoted as a general manager of the Providence Bruins since 2016-2017 and finally now he is the general manager for the Tucson Roadrunners. So what have the Providence Bruins been doing since John Ferguson Jr. has been at the helm? Uh, let's go to Wikipedia for that. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, 43 is the wins column. 23 is a losing column. So let's look at their season records. 43 and 23, 45 and 26, 38, 27. I mean, that's average. And then 38 and 18 before the season was canceled due to, due to the pandemic, finishing first in the Atlantic and then last shortened AHL season, uh, 15 and 6, again, finishing first in the Atlantic AHL division. Um, in his first year as general manager, they went on to the conference finals, it looks like, losing to Syracuse, and then also making the playoffs but having first round exits in subsequent years, in the next two subsequent years. So the Providence Bruins have been a good team, maybe a great team, making the playoffs in every season. John Ferguson Jr. has been at the general manager helm. Pretty good season records. And so, yeah, that's basically the history of John Ferguson Jr. Now, what do I expect from John as the assistant general manager? I feel like he's just going to be in charge of filling in the gaps on the Roadrunners roster, making minor league trades. All the drafting, all the NHL moves are going to be done by Bill Armstrong and his revamped scouting and draft team, which he did last year. Um, he's Bill Armstrong has already made the trades he, need, he needed to make to acquire all the draft picks. They have all the draft picks right now. It is now Bill Armstrong and the scouting department's job to find the right players for the Coyotes and execute on those draft picks, and you got to hit on a lot of them. The next two drafts are very deep. Everyone's saying it's the deepest drafts in decades, both this season coming up and next season's draft. So it's good that we have a lot of high-quality draft picks in our system already. The only trades left to be made are, are Phil Kessel, maybe Clayton Keller and Nick Schmaltz, but I think Phil Kessel is next to go maybe in December if he's had enough of the tank or uh, maybe at the trade deadline. But... I don't expect John Ferguson Jr. to be involved in trades that involve the Coyotes. It's going to be more trades involving the Roadrunners. If they need some depth guys, they trade with other NHL teams for their AHL guys. John Shika, if I'm allowed to say his name, used to make these moves all the time at trade deadlines, getting minor league players to help the Roadrunners push for playoff pushes, if that makes sense. So I don't expect John Ferguson Jr.'s hands too much in the Coyotes, but it's good to get a veteran, experienced professional who's been in the NHL for about 20 years now. With all his experience, he's been in a prime organization in the Boston Bruins. He knows what it takes to win and have a consistent playoff team who goes far, who reaches Stanley Cup Finals and Conference Finals. So I like that experience. It's not like Steve Sullivan, who was a rookie assistant general manager, who uh, he did a good job, Steve Sullivan did. He left abruptly, not sure what happened there. I remember making a video previously about the bad culture and toxic culture surrounding the Coyotes while Chaika and Sullivan were at the helm. So maybe that has to do with that. But um, I'm happy that Bill Armstrong got an experienced guy. He could talk shop. He could uh, bounce things off John Ferguson Jr., get his input, but ultimately it's Bill Armstrong making the final decisions, and I am comfortable with that moving forward. So I think that's it. I uh, just want to make this video. If you are an Arizona Coyotes fan having to defend yourself online, this is why the Maple Leaf fans aren't wrong. They just had a terrible history with this guy, and it is warranted. But he was young. It was a long time ago. 
He's rectified his mistakes. He's been in a successful organization with the Bruins. So, uh, and I don't expect him to be involved too much in the Coyotes' rebuild. So those are my thoughts on the new hire. Uh, Like always, thank for watching and thank you for your support.